Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Santosh. Okay, great. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak on the platform of uh, AIOS webinar because it is one of the prestigious uh, webinar platforms that we have and is uh, very well received and attended thanks to the efforts of AIOS office bearers. It's a pleasure to speak on something that is very close to my heart, that's retinoblastoma, especially during uh, the retinoblastoma awareness week. Why should we know about retinoblastoma? because it is the most common intraocular malignancy in children. It is also a deadly tumor with a potential for up to 50% mortality and presents mostly to an ophthalmologist first, as opposed to any other malignancy which may go to any other specialist. Here the child comes to an ophthalmologist with predominantly ophthalmic symptoms. And it is completely curable if it is detected early. So early detection and its primary presentation to the ophthalmologist give, puts us in a very unique position to diagnose this and get these children treated. World Retinoblastoma Awareness Week is observed from the second Sunday of May for a week, that is 10th to 16th of this month in this year. The main goal of this week is to create awareness about the early diagnosis of retinoblastoma. This is an evolution in the management of retinoblastoma. As you see here, mortality earlier used to be 85 to 98 percent, that higher mortality. Then enucleation came in as the only possible modality for management of retinoblastoma and followed by external beam radiation. So enucleation came in and was the only possible management until about 1950s then very slowly crept in external beam radiation with excellent success compared to only enucleation, but not compared to what kind of success that we have now. Then in the late 1990s came in intravenous chemotherapy. It ruled up to about 2010. And currently it's the era of intra-arterial chemotherapy and intravitreal chemotherapy. So as compared to 1900s, in 2020, we have 98% survival as opposed to 98% mortality. So there's a dramatic turnaround in the management and prognosis of retinoblastoma. So it's been an obvious a success story. In fact, no other malignant disorder systemically has as good a survival as retinoblastoma currently. It's the most successful story in terms of survival. Essentially, that's happened because of early diagnosis and improved methods of treatment. In developed countries, that is the situation. Excellent care, excellent prognosis because of early diagnosis. Whereas in developing countries, mortality is more than 50% still. It's mainly because of delayed detection and the presence of high-risk cases. These are the problems with developing countries. This is the world retinoblastoma map. As you see here, India is dark blue and it has the highest incidence of retinoblastoma, essentially because we have a high live birth rate followed by China. So this part of the world, India and China and some parts of Africa and South America have the highest incidence of retinoblastoma. These are the data that we have 5,000 to 6,000 new cases in the world, estimated incidence of 1,500 to 2,000 new cases every year in India. New retinoblastoma reference to major centers is about 600 only, which means that out of about 1,500 new cases that happen in India, only about 600 go to referral centers, which means that about 70% of these children either don't get treated at all because we have no data on them in India or go to primary or secondary levels of healthcare where enucleation is possibly the only treatment available and protocol-based management is not performed. And we also know that the mortality is 30 to 50% if protocol-based management is not performed. So what in essence it means that 70% of children in India are not receiving protocol-based management as in 2017. And in the last three years, I don't think the situation has changed dramatically. Let's go to clinical manifestations. The most common sign or symptom is leukocoria. It's seen in about 42% of children. This is the number that we had, 2,800 eyes, of which leukocoria was present in 
42%. Leukocoria is the most common symptom as well as the sign of retinoblastoma. Followed by squint. It could be either esotropia as you see in this child or exotropia depending on the age of onset of retinoblastoma and the location in the macula. 23% is the incidence of squint as the primary symptom or sign. In others, reduced vision could be the symptom, especially in older children or children with macular tumor, poor attention to visual stimuli may be the symptom. In elder children who may be able to verbalize, they may complain of reduced vision in a particular eye. Very minority of patients have redness as a symptom. Redness of the eye is not a very common symptom followed by proptosis in about 6 to 8 percent of children. This is because of orbital extension of retinoblastoma and that's the entire clinical spectrum. This is how the tumor begins. A small tumor in the posterior pole develops into a visible leukocoria when the tumor fills about two-thirds of the eye or even half the eye if it's a posteriorly located tumor. Strabismus, extraocular extension, orbital inflammation, and a fungating lesion, which is very, very rare currently. So what are the mask rats of retinoblastoma? There are several mask rats of retinoblastoma and we should be aware of it because generally, you know, retinoblastoma doesn't present like this. So these are diagnosed as simulating conditions and the treatment is delayed. One of which is orbital cellulitis. So if a child has orbital cellulitis for no reason, and it is not resolving with conventional antibiotics, you're supposed to do imaging. Imaging either a simple ultrasound B I think there is a small <coughs> audio burn. Let's connect him. I think Hugo will need to log in again. Admin, peeche se hi problem hai. Uh, Mr. Santosh, Dr. Santosh's uh, problem, sir. The video is frozen. Let me just check out once. Was there a disconnection? No, you're back now. Okay, fine. Yeah. But we can't see your slides. Okay, fine. I'll share the screen again. Uh, have you joined in from a new connection, it seems? Or it's the same? I joined again, sir. Then is Santosh. We feel stuck, I think. Santosh, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, can you move or you will have to move? Uh, yeah, okay. Now you share again. Is it on? Yeah, yeah. it's everything fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. So basically, uh, Luke, uh, after. Uh, uh, 
uh, orbital cellulitis, the second uh, uh, important simulating condition is hypopion uveitis. So if a child were to have a white-eyed uveitis, as you see here, there is hypopion all right. But what about the eye? There is no circumcellary congestion at all. So it's a white-eyed hypopion. White-eyed hypopion is a manifestation of retinoblastoma or medullary epithelioma. So if a child were to have hypopion for no reason and has no circumciliary congestion, has a quiet eye and has no posterior synechia at all, no signs of conventional uveitis, then you should suspect retinoblastoma. The next condition is congenital glaucoma. This child has enlarged cornea, but what is peeping from behind is a tumor. So that's an evident tumor in the presence of what looks like congenital glaucoma. Then some children can present actually with thysis bulbi. Unexplained thysis bulbi in a young child is very suspicious of retinoblastoma because tumor undergoes necrosis, causes inflammation, and that results in a thysical eye, but the retinoblastoma can go undiagnosed and may manifest with orbital retinoblastoma. So in a conventional thysis, what happens, there would be calcification of the coats of the eye, the periphery of the eye, the sclera and the uveal tissue gets calcified in a thysical or atrophic eye. Whereas if it were to be retinoblastoma, when you do a CT scan, there would be intraocular calcification within the vitreous cavity. That is how on imaging, you differentiate intraocular calcification, dystrophic calcification, a thysic or a atrophic eye from that with retinoblastoma. And that's a very important clinical sign to distinguish. The next masquerade is hyphema. You see this child has had a minor trauma. She even has a small lid laceration and she has a full chamber hyphema. Somebody did a hyphema drainage and they let the child be. They did not do a good ultrasound before the hyphema drainage was performed. Six months later, the child comes with extraocular extension, regional lymph node metastasis, as well as intracranial extension. So hyphema in a child with minor trauma should be suspicious of retinoblastoma and you should always do a ultrasound B scan if the fundus cannot be visualized in a child with hyphema. The next masquerade is vitreous hemorrhage. This child has traumatic vitreous hemorrhage or so the retina surgeon thought the child has diffuse vitreous hemorrhage, but the child also has dilated blood vessels, which should not be there in a traumatic vitreous hemorrhage. This child underwent vitrectomy, I believe, by the retina specialist. The child unfortunately had a regmatogenous retinal detachment for which he has done a buckle. And now on top of the buckle, slope of the buckle, you find creamy white area. Posterior to the buckle, there is a creamy white lesion as well. So that is a retinoblastoma. This is how it presented. There was nothing in the posterior aspect at that point in time. Six months later, the tumor has crept posteriorly. We always believe that retinoblastoma starts in the posterior pole and goes peripherally. But there's a variant of retinoblastoma that starts actually in the periphery and creeps posteriorly. And that's diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma in older children. This is the atypical manifestation. And these children don't have a tumor that is very evident. It's not an elevated tumor. They just have placoid thickening of the retina, which is sometimes not diagnosable. These children don't even have calcification. This is acalcific. Hence, even on ultrasound B scan, it can be missed. When we enucleated this child, you can see this is the histopathology of the same child. You see retina, this is the normal thickness of the retina. In the involved area, possibly retina is about two times thicker than the normal retina. There is no evident endophytic or exophytic mass you're used to seeing, right? So this is a diffuse variant of retinoblastoma often manifests with anterior chamber seeding such as uveitis, hypopion, and also vitreous hemorrhage and hyphema. And you should be wary of it. This generally happens in older children. So these are the masquerades of retinoblastoma, white eye hypopion, unexplained thysis bulbi, cataract with neovascular glaucoma, orbital cellulitis, hyphema, and vitreous hemorrhage. We should be aware of these manifestations. Now, clinically, retinoblastoma is of four types. When you look at it on indirect ophthalmoscopy or do an ultrasound, it could be an endophytic mass. Endophytic retinoblastoma is more, most common where the tumor grows into the vitreous cavity and also it has vitreous seeds. Whereas exophytic retinoblastoma produces typically subretinal fluid and also subretinal seeds. So vitreous seeds are classic of endophytic retinoblastoma.
blastoma, whereas SRF and subretinal seeds are classic of exophytic retinoblastoma. We already talked about diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma and what is left is the mixed configuration where a child has a bit of that and bit of this. There could be an endophytic tumor predominantly with a small exophytic component. It could be both of that with a small area of diffuse infiltration. So all that is possible and that's mixed, mixed configuration. So what's important in the diagnosis of retinoblastoma? Retinoblastoma is simply a clinical diagnosis. There is nothing more to it. It's diagnosed by a good indirect ophthalmoscopy done under anesthesia with 360, 360 degree evaluation of the aura serrata with good indentation. That's how you diagnose and completely map out the tumor. Of course, ultrasonography helps. Ultrasonography B scan with intraocular calcification helps in the diagnosis of retinoblastoma and CT scan and MRI are specifically done to rule out if there is any extraocular extension or optic nerve invasion, intracranial extension, or pineoblastomas. So MRI is preferred in hereditary retinoblastoma. We talked about simulating conditions, but we also have to talk about other conditions which retinoblastoma can simulate. These are the five top simulating conditions which retinoblastoma mimics. Coats disease, PH, PHPV, toxocariasis, astrocytic hematoma, and medulloepithelioma. These are the top five conditions. Some of these children get enucleated with the diagnosis of retinoblastoma, we should be aware of it because this is something that we should understand. Now, in Coates disease, there is something called xanthocoria. Xanthocoria is this golden yellow reflex, whereas leukocoria is the white reflex. When somebody has this golden yellow reflex, then most likely it is Coates disease and not retinoblastoma. So if you have a child with whitish reflex, most likely it's retinoblastoma but a yellowish reflex, then most likely it is Coates disease, xanthocoria. Coates disease also has this irregular dilated blood vessels. So segmental dilatation of the blood vessels that end peripherally with a light bulb kind of a dilatation, that's peripheral retinal telangiectasia is classic of Coates disease. This is exactly how a Coates disease child would look like, dilated blood vessels, segmented dilatation, and peripheral retinal telangiectasia with intra and subretinal exudation. Sometimes exudation can be remote. This child has peripheral retinal telangiectasia, but the exudation is in the posterior pole. And this is yellowish feathery kind of exudation. That's very typical of Coates disease. Whereas in retinoblastoma, you see a posteriorly located tumor. Now, the second uh, simulating condition is PHPV. PHPV looks like retinoblastoma, but you find that these children have relative microphthalmus. It may not be very gross microphthalmus, but even a corneal diameter of 10 millimeter on the involved side, as opposed to 11 millimeter in the non-involved side, is indicative that it is relative microphthalmus. In addition, there is prominent ciliary process and also a posterior polar cataract with a vascular or a fibrovascular front running from the posterior aspect of the lens to the optic disc manifesting like this on ultrasound B scan. So this is the optic nerve from there as a fibrovascular fibrous front is arising and that's going to the back of the lens. That's exactly how PHPV will look like. Whereas in retinoblastoma, you don't find any of that. Now in toxocariasis, what happens? There is traction. So this kind of a fold, falciform fold forming from the tumor and going to the center. This is the peripherally located toxocara granuloma. Toxocara can simulate retinoblastoma, not just morphologically the way it appears, but also because it has intralesional calcification. But the giveaway is that there is this fibrovascular front that arises from toxocariasis, a tractional element, whereas in retinoblastoma, there is no traction at all. In a centrally located toxocara granuloma, there is what is called a drag disc appearance with fibrovascular proliferation. It is also a calcified tumor, whereas a posteriorly located retinoblastoma does not have this tractional element. So tractional elements are typical for toxocariasis, whereas retinoblastoma does not have desmoplastic activity. The next one in line is retinal astrocytic hematoma, which could be two types. Non-calcified looks like a button sitting on the retina obscuring the blood vessels, whereas the calcified variant has this kind of sparse calcification or fish egg calcification as it is called. 
So this is typical calcification that is seen in astrocytic hematoma, whereas in retinoblastoma, you find very dense calcification. The last in the list is medulloepithelioma of the ciliary body. Now, medulloepithelioma of the ciliary body is a tumor, embryonic tumor of the ciliary body, not of retina per se, although rarely retina can manifest with medulloepithelioma, that's extremely rare. But it's a tumor of the ciliary body. And it generally happens when the child in the intrauterine life. So zonules don't get developed in that area. Consequently, that is what is called zonular coloboma or lens coloboma. You can see the equator of the lens clearly, and that is a tumor. Whereas in retinoblastoma, that doesn't happen. Even if it's a peripheral retinoblastoma, subluxation of the lens is very rare unless there is gross ciliary body extension. So that's how you differentiate medulla epithelioma from retinoblastoma. Now going on to classification. Classification is extremely important in retinoblastoma. Tumor classifications are of two types. In any cancer for that matter, there are two ways of classifying. One is staging. In staging, survival of the patient or life is the outcome. Whereas in grouping, organ salvage or eye salvage is the outcome. So we have staging for retinoblastoma. We have grouping for retinoblastoma. And most important about classification is that it should follow the logical sequence of evolution of the disease. It should be very simple and easy to recall. Remember how difficult Rees Elsworth classification used to be. Nobody can remember it. It's difficult to remember. You have to refer to something, something that is on the wall or a chart to recall it. It's not something easy that you want to remember. Most important is that it should be applicable to current therapeutic modalities. So these are the criteria for classifying retinoblastoma. So staging system is this. This is called International Retinoblastoma Staging System. Where stage 0 means no enucleation has been performed. Stage 1 is where enucleation has been performed and the tumor is completely resected. And who has to tell you that? Pathologist. So pathology is extremely important in the management of retinoblastoma because pathologist has to tell you whether there is any microscopic residual tumor which immediately makes it stage 2. Stage 3 is regional extension to the orbit and regional lymph node extension. Until stage 3, there is excellent prognosis for retinoblastoma, more than 90% survival. This is the watershed zone. Between stage 3 and stage 4 is the watershed zone. Stage 4 has less than 5% survival. So from 90-95% survival to less than 5% survival in metastatic species. Mainly stage 4 comprises of hematogenous or CNS metastasis. Hematogenous is further subclassified as single and multiple. And CNS extension is further subclassified as precasmatic, CNS mass and leptomeningeal disease. Retinoblastoma grouping. There were two earlier, Rieselsworth and SN. Now we have moved on to international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma, where tumor is classified as A to E, depending on its size and other accessory features. A tumor less than 3 millimeter is group A. So small tumors are group A. B is for bigger tumors. Bigger tumors, that means that tumor more than 3 millimeter in diameter tumor in the macular area, tumor in the foveal area, tumor in the juxtapapillary area less than or equal to 1.5 millimeter in the optic disc, and tumor with subretinal fluid. All these go to group B. So group small tumor less than 3 millimeter, non-macular, non-juxtapapillary, whereas group B is a larger tumor which is close to the optic disc and in the macular area affecting the fovea or has subretinal fluid. Group C or confined tumor is a tumor which is associated with focal subretinal or focal vitreous seeds. Now we already talked about the fact that exophytic tumors have subretinal seeds and endophytic tumors have vitreous seeds. So group C is either an exophytic or an endophytic tumor with focal subretinal or vitreous seeds. D is diffuse. So any exophytic tumor with diffuse subretinal seeds or any endophytic tumor with diffuse vitreous seeds goes into group D. Group E are potentially enucleabilized where tumor involves more than 50% of ocular volume. The child manifests with neovascular glaucoma, hyphema or vitreous hemorrhage. 
and there is obvious invasion of the anterior segment structures that is group e this is international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma there are two variants philadelphia variant and the los angeles variant but you don't have to go into those details but grossly this is how the international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma is done what is really new is tnm classification tnm classification has two types clinical t and pathological t n and m of course are clinical and pathological so clinical tnm is more important than pathological tnm of course both are important in terms of complete uh, grouping of the disease this is something which is little difficult to remember this is always a part of any research study that you do you are supposed to classify using tnm currently most journals insist on it what is the beauty of this tnm classification of retinoblastoma in ajcc 8 is the category of h this is the only malignancy so far where heritability or heritable trait has been added as a classifying factor so it is not tnm it is tnm h in retinoblastoma and that is some something important for you to remember once we have classified the tumor the next step is obviously management of the tumor the goals of management are very very straightforward there are three goals primary secondary and tertiary salvage of life is the primary goal any malignancy for that matter renal cell carcinoma breast cancer salvage of life is the primary goal if that is possible you go on to salvage the organ in our case it is the eye that is the secondary goal if organ salvage is possible then you go on to optimize function that is vision never reverse your goals life salvage comes first followed by eye salvage followed by vision salvage let's look at some of that these are of course the management modalities that are available for retinoblastoma now if you have a small tumor a very small tumor where there is no risk to life there is no risk to eye tumor is about 3 to 4 mm in size then you have to definitely think of optimizing vision so the challenge in a small tumor is not life salvage or eye salvage but the challenge is producing minimal scarring and minimal collateral damage with an aim to produce optimum vision so cryotherapy is one of the modalities for managing a small tumor cryotherapy is typically performed for tumors which are 3 to 4 mm in diameter and 3 to 4 mm in thickness located in the periphery of the retina now cryo is heavy cryo here it is called triple freeze thaw cryotherapy where the tumor is frozen thrice and thawed spontaneously thrice so what happens then is collateral damage so small tumor like this ends up with a large scar of course the tumor is gone there is 90% success but the scar is much larger than the tumor that you began with which is okay for the nasal periphery but if it's a temporal mid periphery then it may cause epiretinal membrane formation dragging of the macular fovea may not the child may not have 2020 vision and also if there is repeated attempted cryotherapy in the same area there could be atrophic retinal break there could be tractional retinal detachment so cryo is good but it does have certain complications which should be aware of this is how we do cryotherapy we elevate the tumor and center it on a 3 mm large cryo probe tumor is elevated on indented and centered this kind of a indentation actually produces what is called temporary enemization it reduces the choroidal circulation because you are indenting the choroid and the retina so because of which transmission of cold is rapid faster there is no leak of temperature so tumor freezes faster and minimal collateral damage will be produced if you indent the tumor very nicely like this and freeze it completely this is a tumor completely frozen and you see a small haze around the frozen tumor that that is nothing but a small layer of vitreous that has frozen along with the tumor so the cryotherapy is so heavy that you have to stop not at the freezing of the tumor but a small bit of vitreous a cuff of vitreous around the tumor also needs to be frozen so that's a heavy cryotherapy and that results in a large scar that results in a scar like this so the next focal modality in management of retinoblastoma is or was photocoagulation the principle of photocoagulation was to enemize the tumor or cut off its blood supply by 
using these large diameter laser burns around it, not in one row, but in two rows like this. So what happens? You begin with a three millimeter tumor and end up with a six or nine millimeter scar. And you also cause blockage of the blood vessel that is passing through the area. So vascular occlusion, larger scar, visual field defect. So if a patient were to have a, say, a juxtapapillary tumor somewhere here, so what will happen? If you photocoagulate it, there will be superior arcade scotoma. So visual field defect, internal limiting membrane rupture causing vitreous seeds, and also because you're blocking the blood supply, there is reduced chemotherapy uptake. These are the problems with photocoagulation. So it is no longer preferred as the focal modality, but instead it is reserved for those situations where transpupillary thermotherapy may not be available. But TTD has come about as the primary focal therapeutic modality. TTD is very beautiful because it does not photocoagulate the retina. It only increases the intertumoral temperature by about 45 to 60 degrees Celsius, thus causing very gentle tumor cell apoptosis. That is how thermotherapy works. So you do thermotherapy not around the tumor, but on top of the tumor. If you do around the tumor, then you get a larger scar as in photocopy. But when you do on top of the tumor, your scar is not going to be larger than the tumor that you began with. That's the advantage of thermotherapy that it produces a localized, nice, well circumscribed, small scar as small as the tumor that you began with. It's extremely safe to do in the paramacular area or very close to the fovea. There is no desmoplastic activity because you're not photocoagulating tissue here. You can see the blood vessels that are passing through the scar. You can see in high magnification are classically patent. So TTT has least damaging effect in terms of collateral damage to the surrounding retina, the blood vessels and an fiber layer. And it is definitely the preferred option in the management of smaller tumors. Now what is new in TTT is ICG enhanced TTT. That's called TTT plus where ICG has a synergic synergistic effect with the wavelength that is used in transpupillary thermotherapy that is semiconductor diode laser and thus causes rapid regression of the tumor. It is typically used in patients where there is a tumor on top of a scar like this patient always had this scar and this small tumor recurred on top of a avascular scar without any pigment background where the uptake of normal TTT is going to be less. So there, if we were to give ICG and then do simultaneous TTT, the uptake would be much better resulting in regression. And in our series, we found a small series, of course, 80% regression in refractory tumors with ICG enhanced TTT and that you can use as a part of your armamentarium. So in focal therapy, what is the current um, agreement is that less is more. That means that more gentle you are, more uh, gentle you are in terms of causing collateral damage, it's much better. And TTT has taken over focal management modalities. Now, what if you have a little larger tumor? Larger tumor means tumors which are not having any risk to life, but of course they may have some risk to loss of an eye or risk to loss of vision. Say a tumor is about 16 millimeter in diameter, eight millimeter in thickness, etc. Plaque brachytherapy is extremely good. It causes about 90% success in tumor control. This is how we uh, do dosimetry for a plaque. We determine how much the optic nerve is getting, how much the lens is getting in terms of radiation damage, and then provide a very safe plaque brachytherapy. This is a surgical step of plaque brachytherapy. You begin with a small uh, peritomy in the quadrant where the tumor is located, dissect the tumor, dissect the tenons, isolate the extra muscle, and then measure exactly where you're supposed to pay, place the plaque. This is determined by your indirect ophthalmoscopy, which you had already performed. Mark that area, localize it again by indirect ophthalmoscopy, either by using a transcleral uh, uh, um, helium neon laser, or by visualization, that's the transcleral helium neon laser being used. That's the ruthenium plaque that goes in under the extraocular muscle and gets sutured to the sclera. So that is the end of the procedure. It produces extremely good result. You see plaque brachytherapy has regressed the tumor, but the disadvantage of plaque brachytherapy is that 
the subtle scar that is around the area of the tumor. See, this was the tumor that we began with. That's the regressed tumor three years later. But you can see RP loss in the area where the tumor was there earlier and small blood vessel occlusion. So plaque is good, but it is not conducive for good vision in uh, locations which are juxtapapillary and uh, macular foveal. So plaque is still used as a secondary management modality following chemo reduction failures or residual tumors, but not primarily. So plaque has specific indications. Now what about expense for the plaque? Plaque is expensive, we thought, but the new Indian plaque is extremely good and it is highly uh, effective and is inexpensive. So this is something that you can consider. Now going to external beam radiation, it is only mentioned to be condemned. External beam radiation was a range, range in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. It was uh, believed to be the only effective modality in managing retinoblastoma with high success. But when you look at the success rate, you find that the success is only good in results worth 1, 2 and 3. But when it comes to group 4 and 5, success falls to about 40 to 50 percent. That is not the only problem with radiation. It comes with its set of complications, some of which are treatable, some of which are not treatable. Cataract is treatable, retinopathy is treatable, papillopathy is not treatable. Some children go into thysis bulbi, and of course there is orbital and hemifacial growth retardation. These are still okay, but what is not okay is second malignant neoplasm. Look at the incidence, 35%. 35% of children who have external beam radiation under the age of 12 months who have heritable retinoblastoma develop second malignant neoplasm. That means that if you were to subject a child to external beam radiation um, under the age of 12 months in a heritable situation, almost one third of them are going to succumb to second malignant neoplasm when they are teenagers. One third of them, that's a big number, as opposed to only 6% if you are not to give radiation. So you have a straight away survival benefit of 29% if you were not to do radiation. So that is something which very important. Radiation is never considered the primary management modality in retinoblastoma. It's only used for salvage, for orbital extension, etc. It's no longer favored. What changed the management of retinoblastoma was this November 1996 issue of Arcus of Ophthalmology, now called JAMA Ophthalmology, where there were a set of four articles each describing the same treatment modality, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, they called it chemo reduction and chemotherapy plus local treatment. So basically, chemotherapy with local treatment has arrived. It was in November 1996 that it was reported. And from there on, it simply took over. It changed the management of retinoblastoma. It was actually a paradigm change from the hazards of radiation and enucleation where uh, children still develop metastasis. This was a pleasant change where you could save life, you could save the eye, and you could also save vision. Chemotherapy initially started as intravenous standard dose. Now there are several forms of chemotherapy. Intravenous high dose, new adjuvant chemoreduction, adjuvant chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy, periocular in the form of injection and even epibulbar drug delivery system, which is called a chemoplaque, intraocular chemotherapy, intravitreal and intracameral. Now, intravenous chemotherapy or chemo reduction, as it was called IVC, is a method of reducing the tumor volume to allow for more focused, less damaging therapeutic measures. It was hailed as it was like going back in time. Example given is like if you have a tumor which is about 20 millimeter in diameter, you can actually make it shrink to about 5 or 6 millimeter in diameter before you hit it with laser. So you're actually going back in time as if it is diagnosing a child about 6 months ahead of time. Even if the child has come to you with an advanced tumor, you can make it shrink and make it smaller before you deliver focal therapeutic modality. Drugs are very simple and straightforward. Carboplatin, etoposide, and vincristine, very common, inexpensive drugs. But before each cycle of chemotherapy, you do uh, external examination under anesthesia. 
and then do what is called a chemo cryotherapy chemo cryotherapy is a small spot of cryotherapy in the extreme periphery to break the blood retinal barrier so that there is increased intravitreal uptake of chemotherapy and you can also start focal therapy from cycle 4 onwards now how does chemotherapy help chemotherapy makes the tumor smaller so chemotherapy helps produce a smaller scar so this is a tumor this is one more tumor here reduced to a small scar reduced to a small flat scar the advantage is that macula is clear why does that happen that happens because of this principle of chemotherapy or the tumor reduction where the tumor always regresses to its source of blood supply this is a very nice example here the tumor is deriving its blood supply from the suprotemporal arcade you can see that right large dilated blood flow now when you start giving chemotherapy tumor regresses towards its source of blood supply that is the suprotemporal arcade thus freeing the fovea and macula very early on so this is you can see this tumor is impinging on the foveola after one cycle of chemotherapy it's left the foveola and it is moving peripherally after three sessions of chemotherapy fovea is extremely clear this child has a good prognosis for vision and the tumor has regressed towards its source of blood supply it always holds on to its source of blood supply thus bring the fovea macula very early in the course of treatment so that maximizes vision the second advantage of chemotherapy is that the subretinal fluid goes away very rapidly this is a patient where there is subretinal fluid and it goes away very rapidly as you see here srf is gone completely thus again maximizing vision so reduction of the tumor away from fovea macula and reduction of srf very early on in the treatment has vision salvage as an advantage so this form of chemotherapy called ivc or intravenous chemotherapy was the standard of care in the early 2000s from late 1996 to about 2010 this actually ruled with good prognosis in the shield series you find that 100% eye salvage in results with 1 2 and 3 but when you go to advanced tumor it is not so great 25% in 5b 50% in 5 which may be okay for the west but in india where or in asian countries where advanced retinoblastoma is the way children manifest in our series of about 1000 eyes we found that 75% of eyes were results worth 5 and 30% were results worth 5b so if children were to present with advanced retinoblastoma primarily in a country then if you were to do intravenous chemotherapy alone then you have success rate as low as 50 or 25% which is not good enough so we have to think of alternatives and those alternatives for advanced retinoblastoma are high dose chemotherapy coupled with periocular chemotherapy now high dose also uses the same group of drugs carboplatin etoposide and vincristin but with a higher dosage and that is more effective as you see here much advanced tumors filling about 75% 80% of which is cavity reduce nicely with high dose chemotherapy so high dose chemotherapy works well it's relatively more effective than standard dose chemotherapy for group d and e that's before intra arterial chemotherapy came in. so before about 2009 10 we had only standard dose intravenous chemotherapy and high dose intravenous chemotherapy we did not have anything else then intra arterial chemotherapy came in intra arterial chemotherapy is a technique where chemotherapy is delivered straight into the ophthalmic artery by catheterizing it so we actually have to use a catheter to get into the ophthalmic artery this is a 400 micron catheter put in place by a interventional neuroradiologist then we inject a set of one drug two drug or three drugs that depends on the institutional protocol you simply peep into the ophthalmic artery like that not to cause spasm and inject a group of drugs we typically use three drugs topotecan melphalan and carboplatin because we want maximum effect in minimum uh, cycles of intra arterial chemotherapy this in some way uh, reduces the expense to the patient this is age dependent dosage of intra arterial chemotherapy protocol it works beautifully well you see here this is a patient where there is bullous retinal detachment gone completely after couple of cycles of intra arterial chemotherapy one more child with bullous retinal detachment tumor is nicely calcified after three sessions of intra arterial chemotherapy 
similar example so intrauterine chemotherapy works extremely well in advanced retinoblastoma you see that this is about 75% of vitreous volume reduced to a almost flat scar with the optic nerve and macula nicely visible following three sessions of intraarterial chemotherapy even in secondary recurrences so this child had a recalcified scar earlier suddenly he comes with a local tumor recurrence and that was treated with a session of intraarterial chemotherapy so it can be used as primary modality of management of retinoblastoma or for recurrences technically it is very feasible 98% is the cancellation rate in our series with only two patients needing balloon but the cost is the only barrier so intraarterial chemotherapy is the most effective management modality for group b and e retinoblastoma and for large recurrences for a b and c anything is okay intravenous is totally comparable to intraarterial for a b and c but only for d and e we have a major advantage with intraarterial chemotherapy though the next issue is about vitreous seeds vitreous seeds are the major bugbear in the management of retinoblastoma now there are how do vitreous seeds form that is important for us to know vitreous seeds can form because of two mechanisms one is a small break in the internal limiting membrane that makes the particles of tumor or the clumps of cells get into the vitreous cavity and those can proliferate the second way a vitreous seeds forms is sprouting of a tumor suppose there is an endophytic tumor a small sprout or a bud will form on an endo endophytic tumor and the bud will break off and this free small tumor will get into the vitreous cavity and will proliferate as a small spiro spe spiroid part of a tumor so basically it can sprout into the vitreous cavity so either by break in the internal limiting membrane or sprouting of the vitreous seeds this cavity they have a capacity for clonal expansion admin can you please see the regarding the connectivity admin yes sir dr hanavar's bandwidth has gone down again sir kai net down ho gaya sir acha Okay, he is uh, reconnecting, and uh, we'll soon have him in the webinar. I've just now spoken to him, and uh, he'll be soon connecting. There was some network issue there. Now it has been resolved, and he is back. Am I okay? Okay. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I was talking about uh, once the uh, vitreous seeds get into the. Uh, Maybe there is some network issue. You can uh, put your your own video off so that uh, your we can see your voice cavity. in the slides. There is a. Um, method okay is that okay now it's okay absolutely fine now all right so one is adherence independent in that the cells need not settle on that is retina cells can proliferate independently in the vitreous cavity and nutrition that is derived from the vitreous is enough for the cells to proliferate this is called adherence independent growth as adherence dependent growth is the cells necessarily have to settle on the surface of the retina 
and then they can proliferate so then they develop what is called epiretinal seeds so adherence independent and adherence dependent growth pattern now what are the types of retinoblastoma seeds i'm not calling them vitreous seeds at this point in time i'm calling them retinoblastoma seeds because that's the change currently that is the very recent change we only knew seeds as vitreous seeds earlier that is how we knew seeds now we have further classified them as prehyloid seeds subhyloid seeds epiretinal seeds intraretinal seeds subretinal seeds and intracameral which is further classified as depository and infiltrative i'll briefly explain all of these these are the classic vitreous seeds we always knew that there are vitreous seeds and this is how they look like now with oct we can further classify them as prehyloid seed depending on the location this was by great work by monia subhyloid seeds again oct dependent classification and in the retina they could be epiretinal seeds intraretinal seeds and subretinal seeds this is how they look like this patient has epiretinal subretinal and intraretinal seeds all types of seeds are present in the same patient now in anterior chamber you could have what is called depository seeds that means that there is no contiguity vitreous seeds pass through the zonules get into the anterior chamber and settle in the anterior chamber that is depository whereas infiltrative would mean that there is infiltration of the trabecular meshwork and the ciliary body and the iris and the tumor cells come into the anterior chamber so depository seeds are not dangerous they are just an extension of vitreous seeds coming into the anterior chamber whereas infiltrative seeds are more dangerous because they would have infiltrated the ciliary body trabecular meshwork and the iris before they come into the anterior chamber now these are very typical infiltrative anterior chamber seeds and you can see that there is a tumor tissue in the anterior chamber angle and the first sign even before you see something in the angle is what is called a t shaped pupil there is straightening of the edge of the pupil in the area wherever there is angle or iris infiltration which can even be subclinical so if the child has a nice circular pupil that is fine suppose for no reason if a child were to develop a squarish edge to the pupil like that a d shaped pupil is an indicative indicator of anterior chamber infiltration now what are the morphological classification of seeds which is seeds morphological classification is again described by monia where he classifies them as dust which are small particles of the seed in the vitreous cavity cloud as the name indicates a very dense collection of vitreous seeds where each seed is not seen discreetly that's a cloud and spear are large globules of vitreous seeds floating in the vitreous cavity so we have a dust we have cloud and we have spear and then we have mixed mixed has all forms in the same eye the next question is how do we treat vitreous seeds there are two clinical situations one is when there is a viable retinal tumor along with vitreous seeds so there is a viable retinal tumor but vitreous seeds are also viable then you cannot get into the eye you cannot give intravitreal injection so you do intravenous chemotherapy or intra arterial chemotherapy along with periocular chemotherapy when there is no retinal tumor which is viable and there are only residual vitreous seeds then we give intravitreal chemotherapy that is how we treat now periocular chemotherapy is given deep posterior subtenance this is how you give it between two recti it could be in any quadrant ex except suprotemporal deep posterior subtenance suprotemporal because you don't want to inject anywhere around the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland that's it so it is we inject either carboplatin or topotecan topotecan is currently favored 2 mg is the dose then it produces nice results which is it start going away this you can start off right from the first cycle of intravenous chemotherapy there is no restriction to the number of injections you can go up to 6 to 8 or even 12 injections these are some of the results of periocular chemotherapy what it does is it makes more of the drug topotecan or carboplatin get into the vitreous cavity more than what intravenous chemotherapy can get into the vitreous cavity and that has a tumoricidal effect on vitreous seeds so you can see all the clumps of vitreous seeds nicely calcified after periocular chemotherapy this is a beautiful regression with periocular chemotherapy this is how the child presented with massive amount of vitreous seeds 
optic disc even obscured clouds of which is seeds clumps of which is seeds powdery material all gone and the tumor calcified disc is seen macula is seen fine after six injections we found about 75% success in eye salvage with this high dose chemotherapy technique and with uh, topotecan we found about 70% success so what happens when there is intravitreal uh, vitreous seed when retinal tumor is completely gone then we give of the injection confirmed by a careful indirect ophthalmoscopy hypotony is achieved by applying gentle pressure over the eye for a few seconds under aseptic precautions the eye is draped after placing the lid speculum pass plana is marked at an appropriate distance away from the limbus age based method was used to determine the safe site for injection under the guidance of operating microscope a 32 gauge needle mounted on the tubercle syringe is introduced into the center of the vitreous the needle is steadily held in place and appropriate dose is injected gently a 3 mm cryoprobe is applied to the puncture site with the needle still steadily held in position The needle is withdrawn through the consolidated eye ball that forms around its base thus precluding fluid reflex through the puncture site. Triple freeze thaw cryotherapy is performed at the injection site. Eye ball is jiggled for the even distribution of the drug in the vitreous. Antibiotic cycloplegic. You know, you freeze the area where you have injected. That is to minimize the risk of extraocular extension. There's one more way you can do it. That is by death by water. You irrigate copiously the uh, surface of the eye with uh, ringer lactate or BSS, and that has a tumorocytal activity. the third way to minimize the risk of uh, extraocular extension is to give periocular injection in the site subconjunctival or subtenon injection in the area where you have uh, made the perforation so there are three ways to prevent it but cryo is just good enough you don't have to resort to death by water or periocular injection now intravitreal chemotherapy when we began we were very very uh, cautious we used to select out cases there were couple of vitreous seeds here that went away encouraged by the response we could go further but as we went along with melphalan melphalan was the described drug of choice for intravitreal chemotherapy by the way we started noticing complications you we found that there was retinal pigment epithelial atrophy and uh, some patients developed uveitis and cataract so melphalan has a complication in pigmented eyes it is not seen so much in caucasian eyes so it has it causes uveitis it causes cataract it also needs weekly injections which is a logistic problem because children have to be anesthetized every week multiple injections are sometimes up to 9 to 12 causes retinal toxicity so we have shifted over to topotecan topotecan we already were familiar with because it was used for periocular chemotherapy the same drug was extended intravitreally there are experimental evidences that it is not uh, going to cause retinal toxicity it doesn't even on erg studies it has much better bioavailability and it is three weekly in injections so there are fewer injections and fewer uh, much lower need to do a uh, general anesthesia procedure so intravitreal topotecan is very useful now intravitreal topotecan is injected as 30 microgram three weekly this is one child this is actually the first or the second child where you can see after three injections the vitreous seeds are gone completely so very very gentle you can see there is no retinal toxicity at all but the seeds are gone this is a patient 30 month old child with prior four doses of periocular carboplatin now with intravitreal topotecan you can see that the seeds are gone one more child with diffuse gone after two doses so it takes about three injections at a mean for a diffuse vitreous seeds ranges from 1 to 6 injections and seeds go away or calcified this is a cloud again got nicely calcified after three injections now when you have a difficult case like this was a difficult case 
where after six injections of intravitreal topotecan, there was a bunch of vitreses that were still there, but the child has extremely good prognosis because disc and macula are healthy. They we combined it with a low dose melphalan. So melphalan generally is given as 30 microgram. Here you can reduce to 10 or 20 microgram along with 30 microgram of topotecan. So when you combine both the drugs, you see that the vitreous seeds are gone. So this is called tandem therapy where you can combine topotecan with melphalan and specifically in refractory situations. This is one more example where you find that after intravitreal topotecan six injections, there's a bunch of vitreous seeds remaining. And when we combined it with melphalan, the same seeds have gone completely. So something that is very useful clinically is tandem therapy. When we reported it initially, we had 100% success with the topotecan. These were highly selected cases. But when you start using them in almost every patient where there is diffuse vitreous seed, the success falls to about 85 or 90%, which is still good enough. You know, when we began, we had no success for vitreous seeds. In fact, radiation was the only treatment that was available for vitreous seeds for which are residual. Now we have this option, which is 90 to 100% successful. When we start treating vitreous seeds, we should know how uh, they regress also. That's very important. Otherwise, how do you judge clinically that seeds have regressed or not? Complete disappearance is called type 0. Conversion into calcified seeds is type 1a or crystalline refringent dust is type 1b amorphous non-spherical seeds is type 2 and a combination of regression of type 1 and 2 is called type 3 this is by monia suppose for example if you have a plump large vitreous seed like this it becomes nicely crenated and calcified that is one way of regression the second way of regression is this large plump seed becomes much smaller and gets densely calcified the third one is it gets smaller and the periphery of it gets calcified. The fourth one is it becomes smaller. The periphery of it remains cloudy, whereas the center has a very dense calcification. So there are many ways of regression of vitreous seeds. And as you start seeing, you'll understand how all they can regress. This is some of the pictures that are showing regression of the vitreous seeds. Now going on to depository or infiltrative seeds. Now in depository or infiltrative seeds, there is... Uh, differentiation is very important. If it's only depository, then you can do either intravitreal topotecan. As you see here, intravitreal topotecan was successful in this patient and the anterior chamber seeds have gone. And in this patient, intracameral chemotherapy, 5 microgram of topotecan was all that is required to get rid of the seeds. So if there are depository seeds, you can do, you do either intravitreal topotecan or intracameral topotecan. And if there are uh, infiltrative seeds, then you have to do plaque brachytherapy as well. Now, the newer uh, development is that if you have a bunch of subretinal seeds, one way to get rid of subretinal seeds is to do heavy laser or thermotherapy. Now, intravitreal chemotherapy can also take care of subretinal seeds. You can see the same patient after a few injections of uh, intravitreal chemotherapy topotecan these subretinal seeds are gone. So this is a newer development where subretinal seeds can be treated with intravitreal chemotherapy. This is one more example, bunch of subretinal seeds, very, very dense subretinal seeds after six cycles of chemotherapy, gone totally with intravitreal chemotherapy, no laser required. So consequently, when you don't do laser, then the retina remains very nice and healthy and there is good prognosis for vision. This is the close-up picture where you see that, you know, there were a bunch of subretinal seeds gone with intravitreal topotecan. So it can be used for subretinal seeds as well. So retinoblastoma seeds are seem to be conquered finally. Now, can we salvage eyes which are potentially unsalvageable? These are unique situations where there is bilateral retinoblastoma and for the sake of a macular tumor in the right eye, you might start on initial chemotherapy and then you plan to enucleate the worst left eye later. And left eye has neovascular glaucoma, large corneal diameter, high pressure, these are potentially enucleable. But as a matter of fact, what happens is that these tumors settle down nicely and the eye is salvaged. So potentially unsalvageable eyes with neovascular glaucoma and duphthalmus can be salvaged. This I already showed. Anterior chamber seeds were earlier indications for enucleation. No, they can be saved. And this is a child with limited orbital extension. You see that there is a limited orbital retinoblastoma and that is completely gone and the tumor is completely calcified 
after intravenous chemotherapy. So there is a possibility of salvage of unsalvageable eyes. This is just incidental. We don't purposely do it. If it's a bilateral retinoblastoma, you treat the other eye and incidentally, some of these advanced eyes get salvaged and that happens in about 60% of situations. So if you have a child, the corollary is that if you have a child who is one-eyed, that means other eye is enucleated and you have an advanced retinoblastoma in the only eye with a advanced retinoblastoma, which is potentially enucleable, you can try to salvage it by judicious, intensive and customized treatment if there is no risk to life. So if there is risk to life, you up, up front enucleate, but if you find that there are no clinical risk factors and there is no risk to life, then you can try to salvage these eyes. So with all these put together, you can see much better success in eye salvage. 90% in 5A and 80% in 5B. This is putting everything together, including intravitreal, intracambial chemotherapy. So now minority of patients, you, you would still need enucleation. In 1970s, 95% of unilateral retinoblastomas were enucleated. In 2005, 25% of unilateral retinoblastoma were enucleated primarily. Currently, it is about 5% or maybe 10% in some centers that are primarily enucleated. So, so enucleation still has a role, but it is much less. Before we go on to enucleation, it is important to know if there are any, if there is any possibility of new adjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation. This is in the literature. In patients who have clinical risk factors for systemic metastasis, especially advanced group eyes with neovascular glaucoma or buphthalmus, anterior segment infiltration, ciliary body infiltration, hyphema, vitreous hemorrhage, and sterile inflammation, would you give chemotherapy before enucleation to reduce the risk of systemic metastasis? Actually, there is no evidence so far that new adjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation helps. But in certain situations, we still do it. Like this patient with sterile inflammation where sclera is indurated, if you were to attempt primary enucleation, there might be perforation of the eye or excessive bleeding. This is one situation where you would give new adjuvant chemotherapy. Another situation is if uh, the child has buphthalmus or staphyloma, where enucleation may be very difficult or some parents want to wait for enucleation. That's a, they want a morning period for the eye. They might want to get enucleation after three months or so once they get you know, psychologically settled down. So there are social issues as well. So in these situations, if you want to start new adjuvant chemotherapy, that's fine. But if it is initiated, it should be completed as per the protocol. So if you cheat on new adjuvant chemotherapy, that means that if you give three cycles and then do enucleation and then don't do anything else thereafter, then the child has a higher risk of developing systemic metastasis. So if you start new adjuvant chemotherapy, it should be completed for six cycles. Now, enucleation has certain fundamentals. One is that primary implant is a must for every child. Primary implant, either silicon or PMMA, integrated implants are not preferred because vascularization of these implants may be impeded if you give... Admin. So, primary investors batches. Was it not audible? Uh, Rajesh? Yeah, now, now you are audible. Okay. We just lost connection. So, uh, your slide was there, but we were not, uh, you were not audible. Now you are. Okay, fine. Yeah. It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. All right. So I was talking about enucleation, primary enucleation. What we'd follow is a myoconjunctival technique where each of the extraocular muscle is harvested and just attached short of the phonesis. I'll show a video clip still, which is better than uh, showing still pictures. This is a child where myoconjunctival enucleation is being performed. This is a unilateral advanced retinoblastoma and a four-year-old child. Uh, you begin with a small lateral canthotomy. That's to increase the space that is available for enucleation. Then you do a 360-degree peritomy. 
always use blunt tip scissors and then you dissect the tenons in oblique meridia between the recti pointing the scissor away from the eye then you tag the recti just short of the insertion not right at the insertion but a couple of millimeter distally and a second set of tag sutures with 60 yacryl 8 millimeter distally and then you disinsert the muzzle using a bipolar radiofrequency electrode to minimize bleeding each muzzle is treated similarly starting with medial inferior lateral and superior in the order that they are inserted then the superior oblique and then the inferior oblique once the muzzles are disinserted you make a small relaxing incision on the temporal conjunctiva prolapse the eyeball through the blades of the speculum and then go in between the lateral rectus and the eyeball and strum the optic nerve using a 15 degree curved tenotomy scissor and once you reach the orbital apex lift by 2 mm then you engage the optic nerve and cut you don't cut at the apex of the orbit because you don't want to cut through structures that pass through superior orbital fissure mark the area where there could be you can see the length of the optic nerve is 19 mm implant is placed posterior to posterior tenons posterior tenons is held up then the posterior tenons is nicely sutured using 60 vicryl sutures interrupted sutures and then myoconjunctival technique imp implies that you suture the muzzle just short of the respective fornix each muzzle goes towards its respective fornix which produces comparable motility of the implant as compared to even porous polyethylene there is a randomized study which has shown that already then you suture the anterior tenons with secure uh, interrupted 60 vicryl sutures then you suture the conjunctiva by what is called a continuous key pattern suture where the edges of the conjunctiva remain everted and well opposed you should not bury the edge of the conjunctiva to minimize the risk of formation of cysts then you put in a conformer and then put in a suture tarsography as well make sure making sure that the conformer doesn't come out or the child doesn't finger out the conformer so that's the end of enucleation now enucleation is not the end of the story because 20 to 30% of children die despite primary enucleation that's either because we haven't done the surgery well books write that 10 mm optic nerve has to be taken but i oppose that i say that longer the better even up to 19 20 mm because longer optic nerve stump you have better is the chance of getting a negative cut end like this patient who has an obvious optic nerve extension if you were to stick to the book you would cut the optic nerve there and the child will have residual optic nerve involvement whereas if you cut say at 19 20 mm you have a much less chance of having optic nerve positivity following enucleation so refined technique is important and following enucleation we have to identify the histopathological risk factors which are seen in about 50% of children in india and what are these histopathological risk factors anterior segment in, in involvement including trabecular meshwork and the iris involvement of the ciliary body this is also a high risk factor choroidal invasion more than 3 mm in thickness or more than 3 mm in diameter that's called major major choroidal invasion and optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina cribrosa so anywhere beyond the lamina cribrosa is a high risk factor if a child has a minor choroidal invasion and optic nerve invasion of any extent again is a combination high risk factor in all these patients you give adjuvant chemotherapy for six cycles in patients who have optic nerve transaction involved is extraocular extension then you give external beam radiation as well does this really help there was controversy in the literature but what settled was this study where we found that if you were not to give adjuvant chemotherapy then 76% children survived but remarkably 24% children developed metastasis so one quarter of children died because of metastasis if you left them at the stage of enucleation without doing anything further and if you were to go a step further discover that they have high risk factors and were to give adjuvant chemotherapy then the risk of metastasis fell to 4% so this immediately gives you a survival benefit of 20% so look at the number of children that you add to the list of survivors just by identifying high risk factors and giving in expense p 
basically just profitima, which could be clinically evident with a proptosis or radiologically evident with a orbital mass, or for you can see. Am I audible, Rajesh? No. Yeah, you are audible. Okay, fine. Or on MRI, you find that optic nerve is thickened. That is also orbital retinoblastoma. Secondary orbital retinoblastoma is when there is recurrence in the orbit following enucleation. Accidental when somebody makes an intraocular tumor extraocular by doing an unwarranted surgery. Overt is when you find on the table during enucleation you find that there is an extraocular extension. Microscopic is when the pathologist tells you that sclera is involved, full thickness or optic nerve transaction is involved. In orbital retinoblastoma, there was a high mortality of 70%. Now, what we do in orbital retinoblastoma is multimodal treatment. So we begin with high-dose chemotherapy. Like this child who has orbital retinoblastoma, we have started off high-dose chemotherapy and the eye has gone into thysis. This is one more example. This is the orbital component of retinoblastoma. After new adjuvant chemotherapy, you can see that the eye has gone into a nice comfortable thysis and the eye is much smaller and consolidated. Then you would do an enucleation with a long optic nerve stump deliver stereotactic radiation to the orbit and give additional six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is a year long treatment where you begin with new adjuvant chemotherapy until the radiological resolution of orbital tumor. Then you do a safe limited surgery. Then you give stereotactic radiation. Then you give adjuvant treatment that is called multimodal treatment, a sequential combination of surgery, radiation and chemotherapy. This works beautifully well for optic nerve invasion. You see thickened optic nerve here become normal after six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, intracranial extension to cavernous sinus, untreatable earlier, now resolved following neoadjuvant chemotherapy. What is left is in the superior orbital fissure, eminently treatable with stereotactic radiation. And for massive tumors like this, we don't have to do orbital excentration, but you can salvage cosmosis by a custom ocular prosthesis following enucleation only. So this is possible salvage of cosmosis and also life is possible with multimodal treatment. So orbital RB also now has a cure. So with all this that I described, what is the prognosis finally? You know, 1000 plus patients who have completed five years of follow-up when we last analyzed, we found that 95% of children were surviving. So survival is very high, 95% and mortality because of metastasis is about 5%. Now in 36% of children, primary enucleation was required because this is a decade old uh, kind of collection of cases. So earlier we would do more primary enucleation. Now we do less than 5%. So this number will very soon change. Chemo reduction in any form, intra-arterial, intravenous, resulted in overall 90% eye salvage. And those who had eye salvage, 95% had vision salvage and 50% had vision more than 20 by 40. Now, these are some of the video clips of children who have bilateral retinoblastoma and so active. Johnny, 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 yes, Papa, eating sugar, no, Papa, telling lies, no, Papa, up in your mouth. This is, a, this is a child with bilateral Very RP. One good. Eye is what is your... You can't Johnny, that, Johnny. But in the other eye, he has, you know, recent recurrence, recent recurrence, which was... Sorry. Yeah. You see, there is a recent recurrence here, which has been treated and very close to the macula, macula very close to the disc, but he's able to do all his normal activities. He's able to draw, paint, everything. So vision salvage is not a theoretical thing. It is actually real. And both these children have bilateral retinoblastoma and she's actually playing like a teacher. Hi, I am Mishka, teacher. Today, I am going to tell you a lesson about to A, apple and H, hat. I'm starting. That's about her and this child with one eye enucleated. Other eye uh, has a Paramacular tumor, and she maintains Hi, a good Nishida. amount of vision even to play music. She's very good at study. Vision salvage is a reality that the plasma is not at all theoretical. Of course, there are socio ba economic barriers to care, there are challenges, and there are solutions as well. But if you have a nice uh, program where there is a social uh, worker and you channelize funding from 
NGOs such as Can Kids, and uh, you know there are many NGOs which can uh, help you. With more than 90% compliance success can be achieved in uh, uh, rec in, in follow-up and complete management. Future prospects will be in genetics, early diagnosis, improved focal therapy, focal drug delivery systems, and advocacy. This, of course, an old um, slide that Dr. Gary Galley had lent to me, just to show how genetics can work. You know, this is a father who has bilateral retinoblastoma. His firstborn child had bilateral retinoblastoma, and they knew the mutation already in the father and the firstborn. When the second child was under conception, the child underwent prenatal diagnosis. The first child was born with bilateral macular retinoblastoma. So at the time of birth, the child had bilateral macular retinoblastoma. The concept was to induce delivery early so that when the child is born, there is no tumor. So they induced early delivery. The child was born with normal fundus. But as the child aged, a small tumor developed there. That was, this is a small tumor that has developed. Dr. Galley at that time did photocoagulation. So the child maintains 20, 20 and you can tell from a child's eyes if he's happy, when he's sad, frightened, or when he's asleep. You can tell many things from a child's eyes, including if he's got cancer. This was a small um, you know, television commercial that was made in South American countries where the pickup retino rate of retinoblastoma actually increased many folds just because of the white reflex uh, that was made popular. Now there are actually mobile phone apps that can also detect white reflex and those are becoming popular. In fact, they can differentiate between a red reflex that is normally seen and a white reflex. And if there's a white reflex, you can send the picture to a reading center and they will advise on further consultation. So in conclusion, I would say that retinoblastoma management seems very, very complex, but it is actually fairly simple. There are protocols for everything and you simply have to individualize the management. You have so many management modalities, so many different types of patients, but it is good to customize the management within the realm of protocols. The current trend is definitely towards chemo reduction and focal therapy. Chemo reduction with intra arterial chemotherapy is the current trend. And focal therapy with transpupillary thermotherapy is also the current trend with improving life, eye, and vision salvage. And most of the management modalities that I sh um, showed are cost effective and are very simple to practice. There is uh, no high science there. It is very simple, and most of these are accessible to many of us as ocular oncologists, along with, of course, help from uh, oncology department. So finally, I would uh, conclude with this slide, retinoblastoma, they live and they're able to see all with protocol-based management. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, we would be happy to answer. Thank you.